Welcome to prayer meeting tonight. Our devotional thoughts come from Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 10. And I say, uh, God's grace is real. That's the title I gave to our thoughts tonight. So verses 1 through 3, Paul writes to us and says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, and once you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Paul tells us, each one of us at one time was dead in trespasses and sins, no matter how good we thought we were. We were still sinners and far away from God. We followed the ways of the world and whatever struck our fancy. And actually, what we thought was our own interest were actually the inspiration of the devil designed to keep us away from God. Now, the evidence of this was clearly seen in our lifestyle. However good we may have thought we were, our lives did not follow the things of God. We may have had some religion, but that religion was not a life of submission to God. Instead, we followed the spirit of disobedience, placing our view on life and right and wrong over what God has revealed. Any of the things we may have done that appeared to follow God were actually acts of disobedience. In other words, they were done out of self-justification. Notice that Paul is teaching that sins are not just physical acts. Some people think then sin is just doing something. But Paul tells us there's more to it. Yes, the lust of the flesh resulted in physical acts of sin, that is true. But some of those acts of sin were also desires of the mind. That's what Paul wrote, okay? And Barnes, the commentator, helps us to understand desires of the mind. He wrote, the will of the mind, or what we call here the desires of the mind, referred to here relates to the wicked thoughts and purposes of the unrenewed nature, the sins which relate rather to the intellect than to the gross passions. Such, for instance, are sins of pride, envy, ambition, covetousness, etc. And Paul means to say that before conversion, they lived to gratify these propensities and to accomplish these desires of the soul. So we are understand that sin is also the disposition to prefer oneself and the lifestyle resulting from that selfishness in whatever it does. Verses 4 through 10, Paul writes, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before, <clears throat> beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, if you've never been convicted of sin, you have no idea of what, God, of what Paul said in verse 4. God is rich in mercy. That expression is simply meaningless to you. Only people saved from sin 
appreciate the great love of God. Why? We personally know that we are not deserving of God's love. But having experienced God's love, we are drawn to him and we are grateful for his love and we are committed to him in a reciprocal love. Through his grace and the atonement in Christ, we who were dead in sin have been made spiritually alive. In other words, we have been resurrected to spiritual life. Our view of life and our goals in life are now focused on the will of God, not the desires of the flesh. In our former life, we were guided by sin and self-love. Being made new in Christ, we are instead guided by the word of God and by the Holy Spirit. So to us, Sin is no longer an option. Yes, we are tempted, but we find God's grace there to take us through those times and to keep us faithful to him. So Paul says we now like to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's not looking to heaven in the future because it's now. It's here. It's a present thing. So what in the world does this mean? The commentator Adam Clark says, we have a right to the kingdom of God, anticipate this glory, and are indescribably happy in the possession of this salvation and our fellowship with Christ Jesus. So, in a practical sense, we are participating in the kingdom of God by assembling together as the church built by Jesus Christ through the experience of salvation from sin. Now, verse 8. That's a verse we all should memorize. How many know this verse? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not in yourself. It is the gift of God. Okay? Faith is what the avenue by which we saved. But notice it's not our faith. That faith is a gift from God. Why? Because as sinners, we had absolutely no faith. How can you have faith in God when you have no faith? So if we're saved by grace through faith, where does that faith come from? It has to come to us as a gift from God. So, God did not save us from sin to make us feel good about ourselves or to feel superior to other people. That's not what it's about. Salvation is a gift we do not deserve, but it is ours through trusting him and obeying his word. Now, trusting and obeying are not to be understood as earning or deserving of salvation. Uh Uh-uh. They are acts of of receiving the gift of salvation, okay? You know, when somebody gives you a gift, you have to actually take hold of it, do you? Receive it. And that's, that's what are we doing by exercising uh, our trusting and our obeying. So why does God save us? Why does God save us? Well, One answer is because of his love. Thank God for that. But beyond that purpose, his purpose includes what Paul says in verse 7, that in the ages to come, he will the extent of grace and his kindness toward us in Christ. In other words, he saves us to be a testimony to other sinners that he loves them and he will extend the grace of salvation to each and every one who will receive it. That's one reason God saves us, to show everyone else that he will do the same for them. God has a purpose for your life in whatever stage of life you may be in. In verse 10, he says, for we are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. How many of us really take time to think through that statement? There's a lot there to digest. Through your experience of salvation in Christ, God placed you in a lifestyle he intended for your life. <clears throat> Beforehand, in Christ, created to good works. A lifestyle he intended for your life. The purpose God has for your life is what Paul calls good works. And these good works are not things that we can do to earn or even keep our salvation. These good works reflect the life of Christ as he lives his life through our lives unto good works. Barnes the comment says, with reference to a holy life or the design for we have been created in Christ is that we should lead a holy life. The pr primary object was it was that we should be holy. That's God's purpose. It isn't just to take you to heaven that you should be holy. That's God's purpose for your life. And friends, God's grace it is only God's grace that can produce the holy life he intends for you to live. Amen.